Well, our speaker today is no stranger to City Club. E. Kimbark McCall Sr. is a longtime member of the club and today marks his fifth appearance at the podium. His remarks this afternoon will focus on the struggle to pass Senate Bill 100, Oregon's controversial land use laws. This month marks the 20th anniversary of the passage of this legislation. He believes so strongly about the importance of this legislation that when recently asked to write the Oregon chapter for a book on recent Western politics, he chose the battle to pass Senate Bill 100 as the most significant political event of the past 40 years. In addition to the discussion of the historical events surrounding the passage of the bill, he will also briefly share some of the controversies that have resulted and which still pose serious threats to the bill's purposes and goals set out by LCDC. Kim McCall is a noted Oregon historian, educator, and author. He has taught at Reed College, Portland State University, and has also served as headmaster and teacher at Catlin Gable. In addition to his active participation in the City Club, which, by the way, included a stint on the Board of Governors in the early 70s, after which he resigned uh, when the club uh, refused to admit women. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> but he has, <laughs> and he has also served as the President of the Urban League and the World Affairs Council. Please join me in welcoming one of our own, Kim McCall Sr., to the City Club. Thank you, Patty. Don't be disturbed by the size of this. It's the fact that I learned a lesson from the Forest Conference, which was to magnify the words, use shorter pages, and uh, hopefully we won't get lost. So settle back and have a good time. I welcome this opportunity today to discuss what I consider the most significant legislative battle in Oregon during the 40-year period from 1950 to 1990. The Land Use Bill of 1973, better known as SB 100, which created the Land Conservation and Development Commission, known as LCDC. It'll be 20 years tomorrow that Governor Tom McCall signed the pioneering bill. And I'm glad that his widow, Audrey, is with us today. It's very nice to have her join us. And I believe that there are a few participants who may be here. I can't identify them all. But in the interest of time, I have eliminated mention of some of the sources and some of the less important events. There was a shameless threat to our environment, declared Governor Tom McCall to the opening session of the state legislature in January 1973. Oregon's status as the environmental model for the nation was menaced. He warned by unfettered despoiling of the land, sagebrush, sagebrush subdivisions, coastal condominia, and the ravenous rampage of suburbia, marvelous McCall words, in the Willamette Valley, the most productive farmland in Oregon. With this and subsequent messages to the legislature, McCall set the stage for one of the most unusual legislative battles in the state's 114-year history. The history of Oregon's efforts to plan for the use of land and water resources goes back at least 82 years to the first Beach Bill of 1911, wherein the state asserted public ownership of all beach areas up to the mean high water mark. These rights were further defined and extended by the Beach Bill of 1967, sponsored by Governor McCall and State Treasurer Robert Straub. And four years later, the legislature passed the Oregon Coastal Conservation and Development Commission Act. He's long names here, which established an official oversight agency for an area of critical concern. For the first time, the state acknowledged the responsibility it shares with coastal cities and counties to protect the coastal resources through comprehensive planning and management. Protecting the coast was only one of several concerns that prompted many Oregonians to take action in the 1960s. In 1961, the legislature attempted to protect prime agricultural lands by authorizing lower tax assessments for land in exclusive farm use zones. It encouraged farmers not to sell to speculators and developers. But the law proved ineffective in slowing leapfrog subdivisions around growing cities of the Willamette Valley. 
Another subject of deep concern to Oregonians was that of water resources, especially the Willamette River. The Oregon Clean Water Act of 1965 resulted followed by the Willamette River Park Systems Act in the spring of 1967, and this led to the establishment in 1973 of the Willamette River Greenway System. Much of the incentive for these actions, apart from a growing national awareness, was Oregon's expanding population, which had grown from 1.5 million in 1950 to 2.1 million in 1970, the nation's 10th largest state in land area. Oregon's 1970 population was two-thirds urban, with nearly half living in this metropolitan area. Approximately 10,000 acres of Willamette Valley farmland were being converted to urban use each year, out of only two million agricultural acres in the entire valley. Secretary of State Clay Myers spoke repeatedly on the issue, asking, what do we want the Willamette Valley to be like in the decades ahead? He called for tighter zoning and effective planning to save the best agricultural lands. The time seemed propitious in 1969 for official corrective action. To the legislature, McCall said, an urban explosion of environmental pollution, I love that term, is threatening the livability of Oregon in such a manner that effective land use planning and zoning have become of statewide, not merely local, concern. And Senate Bill 10 required cities and counties to develop comprehensive plans and to zone all land within their borders by December 31, 1971. Although the bill set only general goals with no standards for evaluating the comprehensive plans and provided no staff or money, SB 10 broke new ground nationally. Oregon became the first state to require all local governments to zone their land and to develop comprehensive plans. And while SB 10 was not fully complied with, its implications spread fear among many landowners who believed their property rights to be in jeopardy. An initiative petition placed on the May 1970 ballot sought to overturn the law by restricting the powers of all planning authorities and limiting the powers of all governments to interfere in the use of rural lands. We've heard this before. Its defeat by 55 to 45 percent brought sighs of relief to the governor. Running for re-election that spring, McCall had actively campaigned against the repeal measure, saying on more than one occasion, repeal SB 10 and you might as well throw me out too. I refuse to preside over the deter deterioration of Oregon's quality environment. A journalist by profession, McCall had grown up in central Oregon, surrounded by the state's natural beauty. Rich, <coughs> ranch life nurtured his strong spirit of independence, not uncommon among Oregon politicians which blended with his sense of humor, was to produce some of the most colorful rhetoric in the Pacific Northwest political history. A lifelong Republican in the family tradition, his grandfather, Samuel McCall, had been a two-term governor of Massachusetts. He rose to the leadership of the more progressive ranks within the GOP nationally. He was elected governor in November 1966 after serving two years as Secretary of State. With the defeat of SB 10 repeal measure, coupled with his re-election victory, McCall felt that he had been given a mandate to continue the land use reform program, or the land use reforms generally, begun three years earlier. He realized that massive public involvement and an educational program were essential. He had two years in which to prepare, because as matters stood, with the conservative Republicans controlling the House, and the Senate dominated by equally conservative Democrats. No corrective legislation was going to make it through the 71 session. His major cohorts in the land use planning fight were state senators Hector McPherson and Ted Halleck, Robert Logan of the Executive Department, L.B. Day, a former director of the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, and Secretary of State Clay Myers. It was the weaknesses in SB 10's implementation that decided McPherson to run for the state senate in 1970. A Republican representing the Albany region, the mild-mannered legislator described by one commentator as, quote, a raw-boned, somewhat cerebral dairy farmer, end quote, <laughs> had become a self-taught expert on land use planning, and McPherson today serves on the LCDC. His senatorial colleague, Joseph T. Ted Halleck, presented a marked contrast to McPherson, both in personality and political partisanship. A 10-year Portland legislator, 
The liberal Democrat was described by friend and foe alike as, quote, intense, brilliant, stubborn, acerbic, and single-minded. And he was likened by another associate to, quote, a cigarette which has been smoked so fast and hard that the paper is intact, but it is burned out on the inside. <laughs> Halleck today is chairman of the Northwest Power Planning Council. A better man could not be in that hot position. The main insider working closely with McPherson was Robert K. Logan, who ran the local government relations division of the governor's office. A former city manager whom McCall had recruited as a staff planner, Logan was a quiet, somewhat self-effacing bureaucrat. He helped McPherson lay out the basic strategy for the campaign. He said, Tom McCall was a risk taker. Logan has remarked, uh, among other things, and while he never became too involved in the details, McCall had absolute faith in his staff and gave its members complete support. L.B. Day, who always used his first initials only, was a senior official of the Mid-Willamette Valley Teamsters Union, closely tied to the canning industry. He had served three terms in the Oregon House, having switched from the Democratic to the Republican Party in 1967 a multifaceted legislature whose, quote, colorful and aggressive style quickly separated his admirers from his opponents. <laughs> he was known for his booming voice and his direct questions and for never tolerating governmental abuses. He said once, controversy is what makes government so damn good. He won <clears throat> and no bill would be more controversial in 1973 than Oregon's land use law. And two years earlier, McCall had appointed him as the first director of the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. The fifth member of the command was Secretary of State Clay Myers, whom McCall had appointed to the office in January 1967. Myers had long been a vocal advocate of land use planning, and as a leader of the Republican Party's progressive wing, who was by nature an independent, he had become a close confidant of McCall. Now, with the aid of Logan and Myers, McCall appointed a Willamette Valley citizens group with a long name, which I won't go through here, headed by Myers, designed to stimulate public awareness of the problems and decisions involved in planning the growth and development of the valley for the next three decades. The project, as it became known, consisted of two phases, a study by Lawrence Halpern and Associates of San Francisco that would draft alternative patterns of growth for the valley by the year 2002, and a plan to get the public involved by means of a booklet and a slideshow on Halpern's scenarios. Logan prepared the booklet entitled The Willamette Valley Choices for the Future, developed the strategies for its use, and assisted Myers as the project manager. Although no action on land use reform per se emerged from the 71 legislature, the session was a triumph for the governor in the first year of his second and final term. The inform, inform, <coughs> important environmental bills included the nation's first bottle bill, a bicycle pass bill, a new beach bill, a billboard removal bill, bonds for pollution abatement. 1971 was also the year in which a book on land use control had a significant impact throughout the country. The Quiet Revolution by Fred Bosselman and David Kellys heavily influenced Senator Hector McPherson, among others, to whom it was introduced the following year by a new staff attorney for Osberg, a Berkeley Law graduate named Henry Richmond. Richmond asked to participate in McPherson's preparation for the 1973 session and became deeply involved in promoting SB 100. In the process, he developed a lasting friendship with McCall. Early in 1972, McPherson decided to form his own committee to develop legislation for the 1973 session. In the 1971 session, his bill to make land use a major study never got past ways and means for its funding, as neither Speaker of the House Robert Smith, an Eastern Oregon Republican, and of course currently a representative from the 2nd District, nor Senate President John Burns, a conservative Portland Democrat, considered it a priority. Burns had been elected president by a coalition of conservative Democrats and Republicans, and McPherson had warned him, I don't give a damn what you do. I'm going to go ahead. Fortunately, the governor provided critical staff support. McPherson told Logan of the executive department what he had in mind, and Logan was delighted, since he was as determined as McPherson to get the job done. 
They decided to set up two committees, one the Land Use Policy Committee to be chaired by McPherson to work on broad-based legislation, and the other to concentrate on strengthening the exclusive farm use zoning enacted in 1969 and on modernizing the subdivision laws. McPherson's broad-based committee, which he called his Land Use Policy Action Group, to which Henry Richmond had offered his services and which would take testimony and draft proposed legislation, angered Se Senate President Burns, who, feeling that McPherson had gone over his head in creating an unofficial interim committee, carried the grudge into the 1973 session. In July 1972, in a major speech, Clay Myers addressed what he termed the greatest threat to our way of life, citing a swelling stream of immigrants crossing our borders. He warned that some of our best recreation land is being snapped up by out-of-state developers. We've heard that before, too. Governor McCall repeatedly dwelt on the same theme as he prepared for a legislative assault, I love that phrase, on the so-called grasping wastrels. By executive order, he had already established 14 regional councils of government, or COGS as they were called, whose formation met federal grant requirements for planning transportation, river cleanup, and sewage projects. He had also requested a check of land sales east of the Cascades. He discovered that some 160,000 acres of arid rangeland, desert, and plains had already been subdivided into 43,000 parcels. He said these kinds of subdivisions made up the bulk of an estimated 1,000 illegal land promotion schemes, which were unrecorded and unregulated. On September 29, 1972, the governor and his secretary of state released a letter to all Oregonians. McCall described the long and tedious two-year effort as the unveiled Project Foresight. He discussed the major points of the Halprin study, which presented two choices or scenarios for each of six categories. The first choice, of course, was to do nothing, and the second was to take action to control growth, which was pictorially uh, re represented. Both Myers and McCall wanted to focus the public awareness and concern created by Project Foresight on the 1973 legislative session. And they hoped the session would produce a package of laws and resolutions that would expedite the decisions that must be made to save the Willamette Valley and ultimately every area of the state. In preparing his package of laws, McPherson and his committee used the model development code from the Quiet Revolution which expanded a broader view of land values than the traditional one, that land's only function is to enable its owner to make money. It is essential, wrote Bosselman and Kelly's, that land be treated as both a resource and a commodity, a maxim that needs to be continually reemphasized, especially this year. In late 1972, land use planning had become a hot issue, according to McPherson. And to Logan, preparing the Oregon land use package was a legislative tour de force unprecedented in the state. He said, we took an issue with no previous legislative or public support, and in just two years, it became a bandwagon. I had so many fronts going, I felt like an Israeli general. <laughs> For three days, from November 20th to 22nd, 1972, more than 600 people attended the Governor's Fifth Conservation Congress at the Hilton Hotel organized by Bob Logan. McCall focused on the issues that would face the legislature as he tried to forge a consensus of desperate interests. The conference's 30-member steering committee comprised a who's who of Oregon's leading businessmen, including John D. Gray, Carl Halverson, Mike Holland, Glenn Jackson, Sam Johnson, and Julian Cheatham. This and subsequent conferences were reported in a new monthly newsletter named Feedback. That's a very interesting story here. Feedback itself became a crucial weapon in Logan's arsenal, another one of his self-described quote-unquote wild activities. According to Logan, I think this is the first time this story has been told, in 1972, HUD gave Oregon $300,000 more than the state has expected to receive as a federal planning grant, a fact not reported to the legislature. Logan was on good terms with HUD officials who were angered by Washington State's lack of compliance with Oregon's example of establishing regional councils of government. The $300,000 was put into a special bank account and, of course, was actually part of Washington's designated planning funds. And Logan's office immediately put the sum to work. 
financing conferences and publications, including the Willamette Valley Choices for the Future pamphlet and feedback, which summarized statewide land use activities and was distributed free. To establish the newsletter, Logan created a nonprofit corporation in Salem, chaired by Portland business executive Carl Halverson. Publicly, Feedback's activities were shrouded in mystery. Supposedly, it was founded by a group of Willamette Valley citizens. No one asked about the source of the money, although Governor McCall knew. Logan funded a staffed office near the Capitol on $30,000 a year for two years. McPherson was delighted by his activities, but, quote, wondered what Logan would be up to next, what was going to happen. Well, few people outside of Logan's office, other than Governor McCall, knew that the original Halperin study, the pamphlet, and the subsequent slideshow, McCall's Project Foresight, had been financed by Logan's office. The Halperin study had never been completed. Logan and his staff rewrote the big study, the great big study, and published it in Salem, and then summarized it in pamphlet form. Project Foresight eventually reached approximately 20,000 Valley residents over the next seven months. According to Logan, it succeeded in ways its creators had not anticipated, generating widespread Valley support for statewide land use planning. 1973 session of the legislature, opened by Governor McCall's blockbuster speech, found the Democrats in control of both houses for the first time in 10 years. On the surface, there appeared to be bipartisan support for strengthening the state role in overseeing local land use planning. But many objections soon began to be heard, not only from legislators, but from interest groups statewide. Vehement host hostility came from rural Clackamas and Washington County landowners, from local officials who felt their authority threatened, and from coastal residents who feared a loss of property values by proposed development restrictions. <coughs> Two candidates emerged as the leading contenders for the Senate president, Ted Halleck of Portland and Jason Bowe of Reedsport, neither one of whom cared much for the other. Um, <laughs> Bowe, of course, represented one of the coastal areas of concern. When Halleck conceded his support to Bowe, the new Senate president felt obligated to toss him a bone in the form of appointment as chairman of the Senate Environmental and Land Use Committee. Bowe purposely loaded the seven-member committee with three other Democrats unsympathetic to McPherson's legislative package. Former Senate President John Burns, Mike Thorne from wealthy Eastern Oregon wheat growing family, currently head of the Port of Portland, and Jack Ripper from the Southern Oregon coast, an area of feared state intrusion. Besides McPherson, the Republican members were Victor Atia, known to all of you, of suburban Washington County, and George Wingard, a builder from Eugene, who was close to McPherson and could be expected to support him. The lineup was crucial because Oregon's legislature had always had a strong committee system, and still does sometimes, which worked over the bills before they were submitted to legislative vote. The bills were usually altered, quote, sometimes beyond recognition, according to McPherson. They could also die in committee and never be reported to the floor. Although numerous bills related to the land use were, were introduced, SB 100 was the critical measure carrying Halleck's and McPherson's names as the bill's co-sponsors, 1,500 copies were printed. All were gone in two days. Halleck found himself in the crossfire, a position he seemed to enjoy. The veteran six-term legislator, with his urbane and persuasive talents, and ran the hearings on a rigorous schedule with supreme efficiency. Every conceivable interest was represented. The liveliest attacks came not from the lobbyists, however, but from committee me members of his own committee. Halleck was fed up with critics who demanded local control, which he felt was a phony issue. Those were his words. Designed to worry the Democrats who were feeling increasing pressure. The irony about the cries for local control was that 90% of all decisions were to be made at the local level. It was the state's ultimate authority that aroused the most fears. The key provision of the bill called for the establishment of a new state agency, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, which would be responsible to the Land Conservation and Development Commission, or the LCDC, consisting of seven commissioners, one from each of the then four congressional districts, and three from the state at large. The commission would be charged with generating and enforcing land use planning goals after holding statewide meetings of citizens and governmental officials. Two provisions of the bill drew the loudest complaints. The authority granted to the 14 appointed regional councils of government, 
which would be the local planning agencies, and the listing of specific areas of critical state concern, such as recreational sites or estuaries, which would be subject to state regulation. By mid-February, SB 100 was in deep trouble. It had almost crumbled, remember Don Barney, the Portland lobbyist? Even the governor had become pessimistic and was so frustrated that he said to Halleck, in a great McCall statement, which may offend some people, but give me $500,000 for SB 100, and he was saying, regardless of his emasculated provisions, and I'll sign the son of a bitch. <laughs> he was applying that if the legislature appropriated the money for the DEQ, he would work through that department by executive order to carry out the original bill's intent by zoning the state using whatever powers he could muster. Ironically, the bill's near defeat occurred just as other established citizen groups were joining the Oregon Environmental Council in support of the bill. Among those groups, the influential Oregon League of Women Voters became active working advocates. At a work session on February 18th, an interesting thing happened. Lobbyists from Weyerhaeuser, Associated Oregon Industries, Oregon Home Builders, Oregon Wheat Growers, Associated Oregon Counties commented on the bill, obviously negatively, for the first time. And Halleck knew that some drastic action was needed. And this, I think, is one of the most significant actions the legislature has probably ever taken, or unusual, certainly, because he devised an unusual strategy. He converted the lobbyists into an ad hoc committee for the purpose of proposing an acceptable draft that would pass. And he appointed L.B. Day as chairman, knowing that he would run a tight operation and produce as strong a bill as could get passed. At the first meeting, Day locked the door and raged until hoarse, glaring at the members and telling them that in the interest of Oregon, they couldn't stand in the way of this bill. Inside of 10 days, L.B. Day had pulled off a near miracle. Councils of government were to be replaced by counties as a review bodies. Areas of critical concern were deleted, but activities of state concern, such as the siting of public facilities, remained. Citizen participation in drawing up comprehensive plans and drafting zoning ordinances became mandatory. Now, many of the bill's staunchest supporters were dismayed by the new SB 100, but Halleck defended the changes. There was no way we could pass the bill with COGS or councils of governments included. He recalled, too many people mistrusted the levels of government that McCall had established five months earlier. Halleck knew that regional government had to be divorced from land use planning. That's an interesting point at that time, and at least at that stage. And at the urging of Mayor Neil Goldschmidt and City Commissioner Lloyd Anderson, he amended the bill to allow Portland, instead of Multnomah County, to retain its review authority within its jurisdiction. In a rare appearance before a legislative committee, the governor urged the senators to accept the revised bill. He said, in most respects, it is more satisfactory than the original bill. McCall's endorsement was strengthened by the support of the Oregon Environmental Council, representing some 80 conservation groups statewide. Even the powerful utility companies finally came on board after a little dealing on the side. Uh, April 6th, the bill passed out of Halleck's committee by a vote of six to one, the only nay vote being cast by John Burns. In the Senate, 12 days later, it passed 18 to 10, with most of the no votes coming from the eastern, southern, and coastal regions of the state. There was still one more hurdle, the House side of the legislature. Halleck implored Representative Nancy Faley of Eugene, his counterpart in the House, not to tamper with the bill, quote, not to change one comma. Changes by her committee or on the House floor would have or could have doomed the entire bill. I decided to risk it, she said. Unchanged, SB 100 passed the House 40 to 20. On May 29th, 20 years tomorrow, Governor McCall happily signed the pioneering measure. As Halleck quipped, and you've heard this before, toward the end of the session, McPherson was the father of land use in Oregon, L.B. Day was the godfather, and I was the obstetrician. <laughs> While the bill was not what he had hoped for initially, he was proud of it. Some of his fellow legislators remained confused over what or just what they had achieved. Calling it a patchwork of political compromises, the Oregon statesman said that its language is so unclear as to leave serious doubts about its authority. Well, McPherson and Halleck had purposely kept the bill general. 
with no specific goals or areas of concern, as otherwise it would have failed. Alex said, the choice was to have this bill or nothing. According to McCall's unpublished biographer, Brent Walth, the governor worried about SB 100's lasting strength, as well he should have. He fretted about the LCDC and the fact that the bill was tremendously hedged. Six months were to pass before Governor McCall appointed the members of the LCDC. Displaying the process, delaying the process was the circulation of over 4,000 referral petitions to repeal SB 100 through a special election in January of 1974. But the referrals backers failed to collect the required signatures. The first chairman of the LCDC was L.B. Day, the savior of SB 100 in McPherson's opinion. As director of the DEQ, he had headed the agency everyone loved to hate. The DEQ was about to be replaced as a favorite whipping boy by the LCDC. Day was to chair most of the goal-setting statewide meetings. As McPherson has aptly described him, a big man, hawk-nosed, sonorous, testy with bureaucrats and politicians, but kindly to inexpert citizens. He loomed over the meetings, popping mailax and seemingly kept alive by a row of filled coffee cups. <laughs> City Club member Steve Schell was one of the original seven members of LCDC. As director of the new department of LCDC, McCall named his former director in state planning, Arnold Kogan. He took office in Arnold Kogan, who was an engineer and urban planner by profession, took office in February 1974, concurrent with the first meetings of LCDC. Kogan quickly realized that he had assumed a Herculean task. The LCDC had 11 months in which to identify and adopt the goals. Three rounds of statewide community meetings were planned during 74 and additional ones in 75, all designed to provide a maximum opportunity for Oregon citizens to become involved in preparing the goals and guidelines. As Kogan has recalled, we were a beleaguered agency with a small staff, inadequate budget, no place to call home, and little help and support other than that offered by the governor and by Logan. On a second try, the legislature had provided only $100,000 at the end of the session, barely enough to keep the agency operating. At a special session in 1974, additional but still inadequate funding from state and federal sources were appropriated. In April and May of 74, Kogan and his commissioners held nearly 30 community workshops with hundreds of citizens who were expected to express their viewpoints on state goals. Daily meetings from dawn to dusk in different cities proved an exhausting pace, all except for day, of course. At one meeting in Florence, opponents came dressed in animal skins, calling themselves the vine maple savages, <laughs> while, dan deciding, while dancing to the beat of drums. Outside the hall, L.B. Day was hanging an effigy from a log truck. The mid to south coast produced meetings of such extreme confrontation that one LCD commissioner suggested drafting a peace goal. By the time of its deadline, December 13, 1974, the commission had held 76 public hearings. Over 10,000 Oregonians were involved one way or another through meetings, direct mailers, television programs. McCall alone taped more than 40 separate public service announcements to each part of the state. On January 1st, 1975, the LCDC adopted 14 goals and guidelines, giving local governments one year in which to comply, which of course was a period that proved entirely unrealistic. It took millions of dollars and numerous deadline extensions before Oregon's 36 counties and 241 cities finally brought their comprehensive plans into compliance with state goals in the mid-1986. And the word compliance must be used loosely. Some of the last plans were pretty shoddy in the 1980s. By the, the goals promulgated by LCDC, the most important and controversial to this day dealt with agricultural lands, goal three, Forest Lands Goal 4, and Urbanization Goal 14. These three goals combined mandated that cities and counties cooperate in drawing urban growth boundaries to engird land already urbanized, as well as any necessary for expected growth until the year 2000. Agricultural lands beyond the urban growth boundaries were to be zoned for exclusive farm use. The less specific forest land goal required the preservation of timberlands in a similar way. Defining and identifying the productive or qualitative character of agricultural and timberlands, i.e. prime or secondary, became critical issues for LCDC in subsequent years, especially recently. 
the housing goal 10, transport goal, tra <coughs> transportation goal 12, and the coastal goal 17 also have received much recent attention. The last five goals pertaining to critical areas were approved in December 1976. In 1979, the legislature created the Land Use Board of Appeals, which gave Oregon the fast, fastest land use process in the nation. A brief summary. One of Tom McCall's last acts of governor was to form the nonprofit group 1,000 Friends of Oregon, January 8, 1975. This organization, he said, gives the people of Oregon a powerful tool to make good land use planning a reality. Under the able and dedicated direction of Henry Richmond, 1,000 Friends has been the watchdog of Oregon land use planning, working daily to see that the city and county comprehensive plans have been followed as they were intended and properly updated as needed. Oregon's land use program was the first of its kind, presenting a model for other states to follow, even though it is doubtful that they could duplicate SB 100. McCall knew that it would be challenged in future years. Ballot measures to repeal SB 100 failed by large margins in 1976, 78, 82, and in 1984, a similar measure failed to make the ballot. In every legislative session to the present day, Challenges have arisen that have forced some modifications, especially by the LCD. C. Actions usually condemned by a thousand friends as attempts to weaken the rules and procedures already on the books. As early as 1974, Arnold Kogan felt pressure from some of the major landowning companies in the state, particularly the Georgia Pacific Corporation. A former vice president of America's largest lumber producer, Bill Mashoski, still leads the fight against land use planning in Oregon through his group, Oregonians in Action, which is dedicated to giving counties greater flexibility in regulating the uses of their land. This group believes that too much private rural land is designated exclusively for agricultural and timber uses. They have wanted a clearer definition of what constitutes prime and secondary lands on which to allow development. And last December, the LCDC reclassified secondary or marginal lands into high-value, important, and small-scale resource lands to be effective this August. Well, this was a classic compromise. 1,000 friends charged the ruling jeopardized more than 25 million acres, while Bill Mashoski called it rules economic idiocy. <clears throat> the secondary lands issue that has baffled land use planners for, six, for years resulted in a legislative deadlock in 1991. Forcing these changes has been increased pressure for rural business and home sites, leading to efforts to expand urban growth boundaries. Development rights and fair compensation have been factors of contention. These are the burning land use issues before the legislature and the LCDC today. But despite the recent changes, the cry for local control still rings out, even though it was this very lack of control over development pressures that led to the passage of SB 100 20 years ago. As Hector McPherson, currently a member of the embattled LCDC, used to say, scratch a farmer and you'll find a subdivider. <laughs> <laughs> An increasing number of county commissioners and legislators are pro-development. Democratic Representative Marilyn Dell a co-sponsor of HB 3661, as cited in the Oregonian today, is the McMinnville realtor. Ray Baum is a freshman Republican from La Grande. With these kinds of interests gaining ascendancy in the legislature, most observers of Oregon politics agree that SB 100 could not be passed in 1993, at least in its original form. Societal conditions are markedly different than what they were 20 years ago. Thus, comparisons are often unreliable. Although Oregon has had a more activist legislature than most Western states, it has, until recently at least, usually provided any governor who was so inclined with the opportunity to dominate the political arena. No governor of the state has ever taken such skillful advantage of his or her opportunities as McCall did with his broad environmental reform program. He formulated the policies and managed them from the executive office with the backing of an able and dedicated energetic staff, often relegating the details to key assistants who we implicitly trusted. <coughs> Caring little for partisan politics and willing to take risks, 
He worked in a situation where the legislative majority of one or both houses and the governor were of different parties, an occurrence common in the West. Without a Democratic legislature in 1973, Republican Governor McCall and his Republican Secretary of State, Clay Myers, could not have succeeded. The working relationship among Democratic Senator Ted Halleck and Republican Senator Hector McPherson and their Republican governor was unique, at least in Oregon's history. Personal rapport, common values, and joint commitment to a cause provided the essential ingredients for success. Such relationships and common, commonly held values certainly do not prevail in Salem today. And this is one major reason that land use planning is under attack with several House bills in the offing. To what extent will Oregonians remain committed to Tom, Governor Tom McCall's growth management values, even if they have to sacrifice some immediate economic rewards? For more than a decade, Oregon has ranked the top of the nation as the best manager of the environment. The strength and effectiveness of Oregon's extremely complex land use control program will depend heavily on the character, the values, I underscore values, and the commitment of its legislators and governors. McCall's example may never be emulated because times have changed. But with his Scotch-Irish passion, he was willing to throw his whole political self into battle to protect the public will. Thank you. Kim, thanks for those remarks. We'll take questions until 1.15. We'll start with one from Andrew Wheeler. Kim, uh, thank you for your, as you might have said, blockbuster speech. I think we learned a lot. I was going to ask you uh, what the Clinton team expurgated from your Forest Conference report. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. Uh, because, you know, the. Because you know the precedents and the players, I am going to ask you about what is the most important land use issue for our central city, and that's our place right here, the east bank of the Willamette. As we did we, we, the, for the west bank, maybe we can save the east bank. The west bank was in Jackson's time and when Goldsmith was the governor. Uh, we have warriors with vision like Tom McCall one is architect and urban planner George Crandall. He's been fighting a hard battle with a lot of good information. I think people are beginning to listen. Our Mayor Vera Katz and Commissioners Lindbergh and Hales square, share a vision to give the river back to our central city. Uh, the Oregon, Oregonian supports that too. Do you think it will happen? If so, why? If not, why not? You're noted for your questions, aren't you, Andrew? All right. Well, this is a toughie. I find myself in a peculiar spot here. I think I was the first one to publish in my second book a strong criticism of what happened with that, uh, putting the freeway along the river there. And it was strictly a financial decision. Glenn Jackson bore most of the responsibility because I know that Terry Shrunk's papers, Ormond Bean's papers and others were filled with pleased to move the freeway back, which would have meant going over the railroad, and SP was wrong, we didn't want that at that time, and some other companies didn't. And uh, so they created the most dangerous curve in the Oregon highway system, coming off the Markham Bridge. And uh, they did, you know, create a problem by putting this, this highway down the, the river, which of course does give a beautiful view. I, uh, I haven't been as enthusiastic about this particular effort. I know I'm against most of my friends uh, on this uh, because I think that, frankly, Earl Blumenauer's original suggestion, which should be in the 25-year plan, I think it'll get there at some point. I don't see it happening for the, uh, for the present time, and uh, because of the fact that they spent $50,000 on this a few years ago, I just don't see the... The, the use of additional funds of that magnitude because the, the same players aren't in place. We don't have the, the representation on, in the House, in Congress, and the Senate uh, is weakened, I should say. Uh, the, uh, we don't have uh, support in the legislature. The legislature is definitely opposed to 
giving any more transportation money to Portland. Uh, they feel that we've had more than had our share. Uh, we, have a, we have some really difficult problems uh, just to get the money. It's not in the long uh, six-year, ten-year plans. Uh, I hope it happens. I hope it will. But it's, it's not unusual to remove a freeway after all. We did this with Harbor Drive approximately 30 years after it was built. Of course, the highway department doesn't like that assumption uh, in any proposal because they don't like to feel they're spending a lot of money on something only to have it removed 30 years later. But this happens all over the United States. And I think it will happen in this case. But I don't personally see uh, it happening in Oregon. Uh, at least in Portland in the foreseeable future. And I thought Earl's original proposal was probably pretty sound. I also have a feeling for the east side business people who have been promised this for 10 or 15 years. There's no access uh, southbound uh, out of the east side. And I don't want to see the east side industrial small business center uh, weakened because they play a very important role uh, in the fact that they are in the city and are not driven out to the country somewhere. It's a very complex issue. I admire the group that's going ahead with this, and I, I hope they can um, come up with something uh, uh, worthwhile. I personally don't think you'll see any action on this uh, for some years, and I think the ramp will go ahead, uh, allowing access southbound. Uh, the river will probably go undergo some additional filling, but that involves the Corps of Engineers, uh, among many governmental agencies. Uh, but it may well occur. I don't think that's going to help you very much, Angie, but uh, sometimes in history you have to live with your mistakes. And uh, we, have, we have lived with a lot of them in this state. And in fact, some of the best decisions were made every, from not doing anything. Uh, but uh, I don't want to get to that. All right. <laughs> Another, Dick, you want to go? I know what Ray's going to talk about, so he's going to... He's... <laughs> Wait. That's why he always sits so close <laughs> to the front. Uh, That's good. Uh, well, as a historian, you're, you're always interested in the future. I'd like to turn what? back to, uh, state, to state issues. We now have a collection of comprehensive plans, uh, but a collection of comprehensive plans doesn't make a state plan. It doesn't mm -hmm. have the vision. It doesn't have the overall vision. And it strikes me that uh, we need that vision, and we need the leadership to get us there. Uh, there seems to be a dearth. We have all kinds of excuses. Uh, Measure 5 reduces funding and st mm -hmm. state planning and so forth. But y you know, it seems to me that Oregon once had a reputation for, and maybe still does a little, but waning in the nation for uh, land use planning. It seems to me, too, that we should have a vision for quality land use planning, rather than maybe uh, Packwood's sexual techniques and the OCA. Uh, where, are the, where are the heroes? Where, where is the next leadership? How can we get there? Well, you know, it's, it's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> leaders generally come out of movements and forces. They don't really create them. Tom came along at the right time. He was the right person uh, at that moment, and he took advantage of those opportunities. And that's the quality of leadership, taking advantage of your opportunities, knowing when to do it. A certain amount of luck is involved. Uh, I think you can compare that to Neil's experience when I think he came along at a far different time, not used to that kind of experience, having been the mayor of the city of Portland with a fairly short agenda and an ability to get things done. And I think this was very frustrating for him. And I think that Tom would be frustrated today because the world has changed so rapidly, as you know. All the different groups, disparate groups that are functioning today, television has a role to play in all of this. Uh, we're not going to find somebody coming along on a white horse to lead us out of our troubles. Uh, it's it's going to come out of some existing organization. Sure, it would be wonderful to have somebody with Tom's vision who could speak. Now, not that Tom wrote all of his speeches, I call Richie wrote many of them, but Tom also always rewrote his speeches and he always gave them in a way. He was an experienced television newsman. He had a, a, a great sense of humor. I think maybe this is what we're lacking today, uh, all the way down the line. He had the ability to take a, 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 what could be a critical question and turn it around and sort of throw it back on the person who asked it and everybody would laugh. 
And that was the end of the issue. You know, um, uh, Jack Kennedy could do this uh, and some other people. Maybe Mr. Clinton can't, I don't know. But uh, no, it's, 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 I think there's no question. But whether, you know, it, it, these are very difficult times, very fragmented times. And it's going to be very hard to find the same kind of unified vision, certainly coming out of one person. Uh, and all we can do is hope for the best that out of some of our current leaders today who are either in or out of office, there will come somebody of that nature. But, uh, and Tom, of course, was willing to risk everything. His biggest, his biggest failure, he felt, as probably many of you know, was his inability to get the voters to approve his tax education plan. Uh, which went through the same session at the end of the session, 73, and into a vote in 74. And he lost it by six percentage points. In other words, if three plus a m minor number percent had gone the other way, we would not be caught up in the Measure 5 problem today. We would not have uh, some of the tax problems, some of the funding problems, some of the school problems we have, because that would have thrown the burden largely on the state, as in the state of Washington. Tom was so discouraged. Uh, that he thought of resigning. In fact, was talked out of it, I think, on a midnight walk with Ron Schmidt and Clay Myers. But he was very depressed by that. Uh, and I'm afraid anybody that tries to do this sort of thing today with the kind of, of passion that he had uh, might equally suffer the same uh, form of depression. I don't know. Uh, we desperately need to find some leaders, but we need to people find people who, if there's not a single person, they will agree on the values. The values are the crucial thing, the human element here. This is crucial to everything. What kind of values do we hold? Uh, no one has expressed it better than our friend Henry here when he talks about greed. I didn't mention greed today, but it's there. It's implicit in this to some extent because it goes back in American history, back to George Washington, goes back to Tom. They were all involved in land speculation back in the 18th century. It's part of our creed. But somehow, uh, during the 60s, we were able to sort of pull it together and to recognize there were other values, public values, that were superior to private values in certain aces. Now, how do you, you know, you've got rights here. You've got constitutional rights, you've got First Amendment, Fifth Amendment rights, you've got all kinds of things. There are a number of ways this could be done, probably. It's very technical. But I think the main thing is values. You've got to find people who are holy that and aren't afraid, are willing to put their whole life on the line for it. In some respects, you could say that Tom, although he had cancer, his, his death was probably ac accelerated by the concern that he had for some of these issues. Uh, and uh, so let's hope that we get another crowd of younger people coming along who have these same kinds of values uh, and see what happens. Ray Polanyi, City Club member. Kim, uh, let me see if I don't disappoint you. You said you probably had an idea of what I would ask. <laughs> Land use is only one part, I'll be an important part of the Oregon vision. Transportation is the other part. But there, funding remains dedicated to road-based, yeah. automobile-based okay. solutions. Do you feel it is time that transportation funding become totally mode flexible to reinforce land use rather than frustrate it? I think you know the answer there, Ray, because I was one of your early supporters on this. Uh, yeah. No, there's no question. I, I think that <laughs> constitutional amendment, which was promoted by the AAA, among others, which ties up all the tax dollars uh, for highway improvement, was a mistake. Although we all know that the Oregon highways are not in very good shape, and that's one reason why it's hard to get any change in that. But there's got to be more flexibility. We should try not to put too many things into a constitution. Uh, it, it makes it uh, too rigid. But that means you've got to have faith in your legislators or your government officials, and there's not a great deal of that around today. So people feel by tying it up into a constitutional amendment, uh, it would be, uh, uh, this is one way to protect them. The uh, same thing applies to taxes. I have always been, I've long been a uh, favorite of sales tax, a limited sales tax, and then uh, one which was, was, was proper exclusions. This was part of Tom McCall's plan back in 73. We're one of five states that doesn't have one, and I think you can take your uniqueness too far sometimes, uh, which Oregonians are a habit of doing. In fact, we, we uh, uh, but uh, that's another matter. But I still think that uh, uh, these things should be, we've got to create somehow, 
more confidence in those who represent us, but then we've got to send better people to the legislature. Uh, too many legislators today represent, again, very specific interests, particularly realtors, developers, and so on. County commissioners the same way. This reminds me of the 1920s, when your county commissioners, particularly in this area, were entirely real estate people. Uh, and uh, nothing's wrong with the real estate business, but uh, it's, uh, it's an important business, and uh, I'm glad we've got some honest real estate people operating. But the point is, you have to look beyond your own nose. And I think this is the problem, same way with the AAA. They, they, they simply can't see anything beyond anything which is going to help cars go down the highway. Uh, I hope some, someday, but unfortunately, usually it takes a disastrous situation to force people to change. A traumatic event, like another eruption of Mount St. Helens, something like that. And everybody then begins to say, my God, who's representing us? Blaming it on them, of course. But that's what created commission government in the first place, um, back in Texas, when they had a tidal wave that destroyed Galveston. So uh, who knows? I, I, I think we've got to keep plugging away at it. That's all. Thank you. Getting close to the end of the line here, I think. But maybe one more question quick. Yeah. Mary McCarthy, City Club member. You mentioned about youth and wanting uh, better leaders. Do you have any suggestions how the youth could be educated about land use planning? Because when I was in school, I didn't know anything about it. Well, you're right. And uh, in fact, when I was, uh, when I was, one of the stages of my life when I had, was developing urban history courses at Catlin Gable, and, and, and I uh, was interested in all of this, having been in Europe for a while, and I invited Carl Halverson to come out with the plans of uh, Mountain Park at that time, and he laid them all out in front of the students. And you'd be surprised how many of those uh, kids really got interested. Uh, you have to have teachers who are concerned and are interested. Uh, and it starts you know, all the way down the line. Uh, it's something you have to be prepared to discuss in school and have speakers, and, and uh, it, it's a very slow process. But uh, I'm afraid that many of our teachers are, have not had the training or the, beyond just a, a cursory interest. Maybe you, maybe you could write a book about it for kids? <laughs> well, if I could sell the rest of my last book, I might. But, you know, uh, I must say that the, 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 the price of fame is high. Thanks very much. <laughs> Tim, thanks very much for sharing that rich history with us. I enjoyed the history piece of it, but I think what I will take away from this is something that you said in the question and answer period, and that is that it's about values, and that if we could get the values together, maybe we could accomplish something. And the second thing that you said, that leadership is about taking advantage of your opportunities. So hopefully our legislature and the citizenry can get that together and we can accomplish something as significant as uh, the Oregon land use laws in 1973. We are adjourned. Thank you.